Hi, welcome back. To this, my second data update for 2022. And this one, I want to focus on equities. And as I start my focus on equities, I want to remind you about a post that I put up exactly a year ago leading into 2021. At the time, I said the two big questions facing investors were how quickly economies would grow coming out of COVID and the inflation concerns that would come with it. And looking at markets, my argument was that while equities looked expensive, especially in the US, relative to historic metrics like PE ratios, given the low risk-free rates, the T-bond rate was at 0.93%, and the stocks looked reasonably priced. Now, leading into 2020, it's amazing how it's like Groundhog Day. We're asking the same questions. The first is about whether economic growth can stay robust. The other is the concern about inflation. COVID still with us, even though we thought it would disappear last year. And then we look at stocks and we see the same phenomenon we saw last year. They look expensive on historic metrics, but risk free rates are low. Now, I don't want to repeat what I said last week, but I will start by looking at what last year delivered in terms of stock returns, break them down by subgroups, and then come back and assess where do stocks stand now and where could they go in 2022. So let's start with the year that was. In this graph, I compare 2021 to the year that came before it. Now, 2020 was a rocky year, it was a roller coaster year. And you can see that in the monthly returns you got in the S&P 500. February and March, stocks collapsed, and then they came back, more than came back over the rest of the year. And by the end of the year, the S&P 500 was up about 16 and a quarter percent. That was 2020. Now, 2021 was an even better year overall in terms of stock returns, up 26.9 percent. But if you look at the month to month returns, it was a much more stable, much more sedate year. In fact, other than September, every month of the year was either a really good month or close to a neutral month. So overall, stocks were, did well in 2021, were up 26.9 percent. If you add the dividend yield to it, the total returns in 2021 work out to about 28.5 percent. Now, where does it put us in a historical context? In this graph, I look at stock returns on the S&P 500. Now, technically, the S&P 500 started in the mid 50s, but I've kind of back reverse engineered a top, you know, large market cap index going back to 1928. You see the returns on an annual basis going back to 1928. Now, I've broken it down into sub periods. The average return, if you go all the way back to 1928 on an annual basis, is about 11.82%. Just in the last 10 years, the average return is up to 17%. I've also reported the median returns as well as the best and the worst years. The best year that stocks have seen is a return of 52.56%. The worst year, stocks were down 44%. Gives you a sense of stocks on average have been up and they've been up strongly, but you've had good years and bad years in the midst. Now, I wanted to see how 2021 ranked relative to history. So here's the first thing I did. I looked at the annual return in the most recent year, 2021, 28.47%, and compared it to annual returns over the 94 years of data that I have, 1928 through 2021. It ranks 20th. It's a really good year, but it's not an insanely good year. But then I stopped and said, not only was 2021 a good year, but so was 2020 and so was 2019. Cumulatively, over the last three years, the cumulative return on the S&P 500 has been close to 100%. Now, if you look at that ranking, that puts you eighth. If you look at 92 three-year periods, and I'm looking at rolling time periods, 1928 through 30, 1929 through 31, etc., all the way through 2021, ranked eighth. If you look at a five-year time period, the last five years have been good years for stocks. The total return has been 132%. But your 12th out of the 95 year rolling periods you have in US stocks. And if you look at a 10 year period, stocks are up 356%. That still put you only 16th on the list of, five, of 10 year rolling periods. So we've had a good year, a good three years, a good five years, a good decade, but nothing here is something we've never seen before. There have been other good periods in the past. Now, digging through a little bit, breaking U.S. stocks down by subgroups, let's start with sectors. 
and 2020, the clear winners were technology, which was up almost 49%, and, and consumer discretion were up almost 61%. So in 2020, tech stocks did really well. Consumer discretionary did really well. The worst performing sector in 2020 was energy, down 34% because oil prices were down. Now take a look at 2021. And it's a contrarian's dream in terms of which sectors did best and which ones did worst. The best performing sector by far was energy. A comeback from 2020, up 54%. The next best is real estate. Technology was not bad, 27%, but it went back to the middle of the pack. So it's again, if you need a, a, you know, some kind of warning of not to take last year's returns and extrapolate in the future, just looking at 2020 and 2021 should give you that indication. Next, I looked at US stocks broken down by PE ratio. Now, I know I'm being simpl simplistic, but historically, value investors have migrated towards low P ratio stocks and growth investors have gone towards high P ratio stocks or money losing companies. Now, if you look at 2020, the clear winners were the high P ratio stocks. Growth destroyed value in 2020. 2021, he reverted back to a norm, which is, hey, nothing seemed to win. There were no, I mean, there is nothing that stands out in terms of trend lines. So clearly in 2021, you did not see what you saw in 2020, where growth stocks dominated over value stocks. Incidentally, I also broke stocks based on price to book ratios, because some people prefer to think of that as a better measure of value. There again, in 2020, high price to book stocks beat low price to book stocks in 2021, much more even playing field. I looked at growth rates and revenues. Again, 2020, high revenue growth companies beat out low revenue growth companies. 2021, much more even performance across the spectrum. Incidentally, one of the fixations I have is I look at companies by age because I like to connect them to a corporate life cycle. In 2020, young companies easily beat out older companies. Take a look at the 2020 returns. But in 2021, again, there's no clear pattern that I can see in the returns. In fact, older companies did do much better than younger companies for the most part in 2021. So take with, uh, from that whatever you might, but clearly 2021 was not just a really good year for stocks, but it saw a very different set of stocks winning over the course of the year. Now, just briefly, I want to talk a little bit about markets outside the U.S. because I plan to come back and talk, and talk about this in more detail in a couple of sessions. So in this one, I just broke down the you know, equity markets across the globe geographically into subgroups and looked at their dollar returns. So let me emphasize again, these are dollar returns, not local currency returns, just to keep them on an even playing field. The very best market, again, in 2020 was China. The very worst markets, very worst markets were Eastern Europe and Russia and the UK. Now, if you look at 2021, if you look at China, China's come back to earth. It didn't have a bad year, but clearly it did much it did worse than the global than global equities. The US continued to outperform up 23%. But Latin America and Caribbean, the Caribbean, had the worst year of all markets in terms of dollar returns, down almost 20%. Again, a, a shifting of which geographies did well and badly. The very best market in 2021 was India, up 34%. Now, what does this all mean? I'm not sure. I'm not suggesting that India will continue to outperform and China will continue to underperform. But it shows you how on a year-to-year -year basis, regional returns can shift and the winners of one year can be the losers of the next. Now, all of this is looking backwards. But equities, investing in equities is about looking forward. And for decades now, I struggled with a way of measuring the price of risk in equity markets. Let me step back and give you an intuitive sense of what you're trying to capture in the price of risk. When you invest in equities, you invest in equities because you hope, you pray, you expect to earn a return higher than what you would make investing in something risk-free. The price of risk is how big that premium is you demand for investing in equity markets. It's called the equity risk premium, but it's the price of risk in equity markets. 
Now, many people, when they're asked to estimate the price of risk in equity markets, the equity risk premium, look backwards, compute a historical premium. Now, I don't think that's a great idea because you know, what we want as a measure of risk in the equity markets is a forward-looking dynamic measure. So I'll give you my way of thinking about how to best measure it. And I'm going to go to the bond markets to give you an analogy that I'm going to use. In the bond markets, you know how we compute yield to maturity, right? We take the price of the bond, we take the coupons and the face value of the bond, and then we solve for that discount rate that makes the present value of the coupons and the face value, the cash flows, equal to the price of the bond. It's an internal rate of return for a bond. About 30 years ago, I started doing something similar for equity markets. Well, instead of looking at the price of the bond, I looked at the price that you paid for equities and the index level, the equity index level. Instead of coupons and face value, I looked at expected cash flows from investing in stocks. Now, in the old days, this used to be just dividends, but in the last few decades, it's been supplemented with buybacks, dividends and buybacks. And unlike coupons, which are a fixed number that, I, that you know up front, dividends and buybacks have to be estimated. And finally, unlike a bond which comes with a finite maturity, equities can go on and on, potentially forever. So if you think about the process, here's what we have. Instead of the price of the bond, you have the level of the index. Instead of you know, coupons and face value of dividends and buybacks, instead of ending it with a face value, you assume that cash flows will continue to grow at a constant rate forever, the rate at which the economy is growing at some point in time. You're saying, now what? You compute for that discount rate that makes the present value of cash flows and equities equal to the level of the index. That is an implied expected return that you're building into stocks given what you paid for them and given your expected cash flows. You subtract out the risk-free rate, the T-bond rate from that, you get an implied equity risk premium. Now, rather than bore you with abstractions, let's make this real. Let's look at the start of 2022 and what the implied equity risk premium looked like on January 1st, 2022. The S&P, as I said, had a good year in 2021. At the start of 2022, it was at 4,766.18. That's what you paid for stocks. In the 12 months leading in to 2022, the cash flows you'd have received on those 500 companies would have summed up to about 147.24. Now notice that almost two thirds, close to two thirds of those cash flows are coming from buybacks, 88 from buybacks, about 59 from dividends, 147.24. Incidentally, that's a big comeback from 2020 numbers when COVID really made an impact on those cash flows. So earnings have come back and cash flows have come back and analysts are looking, feeling pretty optimistic about future earnings. So for the first couple of years, I've actually built in their, ex, or for the next five years, I've built in the expected growth that analysts are projecting. And it's about 6.47% a year. So if you take the cash flows from the most recent year, you grow them, grow them at 6.47% a year for the next five years. You've got dividends and buybacks for the next five years. As I said, beyond the fifth year, because these are the 500 largest market cap companies, I'm going to assume that the growth rate in these cash flows will drop back to the nominal growth rate in the economy. Now, if I've used the risk-free rate as my proxy for that for a long time. And if you need justification, you can go look at some of the stuff I've written. But beyond the fifth year, I'm going to bring the growth rate down to 1.51%. You're saying, where did that come from? That's today's T-bond rate. So I've got my expected cash flows for the next five years, and I've got those cash flows growing at 1.51% a year in perpetuity after the fifth year. Now I know the level of the index, I know the cash flows, I can solve for the discount rate. Solve is probably too loose a word here, because you can either get this number by trial and error, you can mathematically solve for it, or you can use the solver function in Excel, which does, does trial and error much more quickly than you and I can. And by trial and error, the expected return that you come back with, the IRR, that makes the present value of those cash flows equal to the level of the index is 5.75%. You think, what does that tell me? At the start of 2022, stocks are being priced to deliver an expected return of 5.75% a year in perpetuity for the very long term. You subtract out the 10-year T-bond rate, 
the implied equity risk premium at the start of 2022 is 4.24%. That is the price of risk in equity markets. Now, as I've said before, to me, this is the single most useful metric to measure whether stocks are collectively being priced reasonably. I'll give you one way in which you can use this. You can compare this number, you can look at this number over time. It's a forward looking dynamic number, so it will shift over time. In 2020, it did somersaults. Basically, you can see that between February and March, this implied equity risk premium went from about 4.7% to close to 8%. That's what happens when people freak out, when they get really scared. But the story of 2020 was how quickly the number came back to pre-crisis levels. As I said, risk capital stayed in the game. This made 2020 a unique crisis. 2021 equity risk premiums followed a more sedate path. You can see they were between 4 and 5% during the course of the entire year before ending the year, as I said, at 4.24%. Now, as I said, this is the single most critical metric that I th can think of to gauge where markets are. And one way to use this, ask the question, is this a number that you can live with? Is 4.24% a reasonable number? Because if your response is no, it is too low, then basically you're telling me stocks are overpriced. If you say it's too high, then you're saying stocks are cheap. So one way to, to gauge whether where we are at the start of 2022 is put 4.24% in a larger context, which is what I've done in this graph, where I've implied equity risk premiums for the US going back to 1960. I'll start with the good news, 4.24%. It's actually a little higher than that historic norm. So purely on a numerical basis, it doesn't look bad. In fact, to give you a contrast, the, at the peak of the dot-com boom, that the equity risk premium for the U.S. dropped to 2%. So in, in 1999, if you looked at the equity risk premium and you said, that number is too low, you'd have had lots of ammunition. You don't have the same amount of ammunition at the start of 2022. Of course, you could argue that relative to the last decade, stocks look expensive because the premium is low. But you can see it's a much murkier picture we're looking at at 4.24%. Now that's the glass half full. Here's the glass half empty. Remember that 4.24% is the equity risk premium. If you add that on to the T-bond rate, you come up with an expected return of 5.75%. And if you compare that expected return to the numbers historically, it's a little scary. We're at a historic low. The only consolation price is we were about the same number last year and we did well last year. But relative to history, we're earning returns we haven't seen in 60 years. The total expected return looks low. But the culprit here is not the premium that stocks are earning, but the risk-free rate. In the next, next session, I will talk a little bit more about the T-bond rate. But the bottom line here is your views about stocks are going to be governed by what you think T-bond rates are going to do over the next three months, the next six months, or the next year. So that's an implied equity risk premium, and it can be used to make a market assessment. But, you know, I, I am always shy about, or, or uh, I'm shy is not the right word. I'm averse to making judgments about the overall market for a simple reason. I'm not a very good market timer. I, you know, I used to tell people I'm not a market timer, but that would be a lie. We're all market timers. We're either implicitly timing markets based on how much cash we have in our portfolio. So implicit market timing is when the cash holdings in your portfolio balloon out to 30 or 40 percent or drop down because you're bullish. Explicit market timing, you actually actively bet on market direction. I'm not an active market timer, but I am. I think about markets. So rather than give you just my assessment, I thought I'd lead you through the process of how I came up with the value of the market, not with the, with the end game of telling you this is the right value, so, but that you can disagree with me and come up with your own assessment. So let's build up to a valuation of the market here and let's start with earnings. The best place to start is by looking at historical data. Now, and if you look at um, the earning, earnings over time, the red column shows you how earnings have grown over time and you can see the growth rates have gone. You've had good years, you've had bad years. The last two years, a bit of whiplash because 2020 was an awful year for company earnings. Why? Because of COVID. 2021 was a really good year as we recovered. In fact, we're back to an earnings level 
well above where we were in 2019. So if there's a story here, it's earnings had a bad year or the S&P 500 company had a bad year in terms of earnings in 2020, but they came back in 2021. Analysts, as I said, are upbeat about the future. So in this page, I've actually summarized what analyst estimates are. I've used uh, Ed Yardeni's estimates. I have a great deal of respect for him. He makes these forecasts every week. Uh, you know, I would never have the stomach to do this. So the first set of numbers are his forecasts for 2022, 2023, 220, and 235. He also gives you consensus estimates for 2020. So these are analysts collectively who forecast earnings for the S&P 500. And you can see they're pretty close. You know, their, their estimates are a little higher than Mr. Yardeni's for 2022 and 23. And Thomson Reuters also provides consensus estimates, which are pretty close. So you can see that analysts collectively are forecasting growth and looking at a subset of market strategists who make forecasts of S&P earnings for the next year, you can see that their forecasts are even more upbeat than what analysts on average are forecasting. So again, you know, I'm not suggesting that analysts are right because you know I know the pushback against analysts that they tend to be biased well, you know, these are often top-down analysts. And here, you know, while analysts who, who value individual companies often are biased upwards in their forecast of growth for those companies, there's little evidence that analysts who estimate top-down for the entire index make the same mistake. They tend to be wrong, like we all are, but they undershoot and overshoot like the rest of us. Now, it goes without saying that as investors in stocks, you don't get claim on earnings, you get a claim on cash flows. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, the, those cash flows used to take the form of just dividends until the 1980s. But over the last three decades, at least on the S&P 500, they've increasingly been supplemented with buybacks. A different way of returning cash. Some people don't like it, but it is what it is. We have to live in the world we're in. And in this table, I've looked at earnings and cash return to investors, either in dividends and buybacks, going back every year from 2001 to 2021, at least the trailing 12 months. So if you look at the, the cash payout, which is, I think, the more legitimate measure of cash return, that number over the last 20 years has averaged about 85%. In the last 12 months leading into 2022, it was about 77.36%. I'll come back and tell you how I'm going to use this in my valuation, but at least it gives you a sense of perspective on what U.S. companies at least return in the form of cash flows. Finally, on the risk-free rate and the equity risk premium. As I you know, as you look at the T bond rate at 1.51%, that's up from 0.93%, but it's still low by historic norms. And with all this talk about inflation, I'm going to make the assumption in my valuation that this rate will continue to drift upwards. Keyword is drift upwards, not spike upwards, because that's going to create a very different consequence for valuation to reach two and a half percent. On the equity risk premium front, since I'm trying to value the index, I'm going to, not going to take the implied number because that's going to tell me the index is then fairly valued. I'm going to make my own judgment. I'm going to come up with an, uh, an expected risk premium of 5%, higher than the historic average of 4.21%, but reflecting the fact that markets, global markets have become more volatile since 2008. I think I have all the ammunition I need to value the index, so here's, one, here's my valuation. So let me list out my assumptions. For the earnings for 2022 and 2023, I'm going to go with an analyst forecast. Now, you might disagree with me, and if you, in fact, download the spreadsheet, I'll let you kind of upgrade or downgrade those num numbers if you feel analysts are being over-optimistic or over-pessimistic. For the growth rates beyond 2020 to 2023, I'm going to assume that the growth rate will decrease towards a stable growth rate. And if you remember, my stable growth rate assumption is that's equal to the risk-free rate. I will assume the risk-free rate will rise from 1.51% to 2.5%, and I'm going to use a 5% premium. So if you look at my expected return over time, it starts at about 6.5% and converges on 7.5%, closer to what we used to see prior to the last two years. So I'm requiring a return on stocks of between 65 to 7.5%. I'm not asking for the moon. And I discount the cash flows I get based on my assumptions. What I get as a present value, which is my intrinsic value for the index, is about 4320 
that puts him about 10% less than the index. Now remember, I'm making a lot of assumptions here, but the key thing is I'm not coming up 40% below the index or 60%, which is what you would expect if you really thought the market was in a bubble, I'm getting 10% less. Now again, as I said, this, these are my perspectives, my views, and I'm not going to insist that, in effect, it would be silly of me to insist that this is the right value for the index. I would like you to take my, my valuation and set it to the side, but then go in and change the inputs that you don't agree with on earnings and cash flows and risk free rates and equity risk premiums. Come up with your own assessment of value. Why? Because I think for sensible investing, for good investing, we all need to take ownership of our investment decisions from asset allocation to which stocks you pick rather than turn it over to talking heads on TV or um, market strategies at investment banks or whichever market guru got it right the last year. 